Today, we're talking to Rick Rule. Rick is one of the most successful and famed natural resource and commodities investors in all markets from energies to precious metals. And we're going to be discussing what the heck is going on with our global financial system and how this affects your money, your future, and the best ways that you can prepare yourself. So if you're excited about today's video, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and bell notification to get notified for future episodes. Give us a comment down below that says Rick Rule rules right there down below. We'll have the link where Rick will do a free assessment of your portfolio in the description right there down below. And last but not least, we'll give a shout out to our sponsor for today's episode, which is Vizla Silver, one of our favorite silver and gold mining stocks, the first ever sponsor for our main show here. And uh, I'm proud to say has done incredibly well since they became the sponsor of our channel. And so thank you, Vizla Silver. And uh, thanks for being here, Rick. Always a pleasure, Jake. Thank you for having me back. Okay, so my first question is, uh, how many years of economics do you believe it took for Joe Biden to put together that mathematical equation on the $3.5 trillion package that $3.5 trillion equals zero? Did that <laughs> add up with what you were thinking on the math? You know, obviously, government people, people who spend money do math differently than people who provide the money that they spend. I would suggest to you that the taxpayers probably have a better sense of arithmetic uh, than the administration does. That notwithstanding, Jake, I continue to be amazed that the voters tend to believe that you can add a column of negative numbers, which is to say deficits, and come up with a positive sum. The idea that you can service $150 trillion in on balance sheet and off balance sheet liabilities at the federal level with a budget that's in deficit between three and six trillion dollars, um, as, as you suggest, um, implies uh, a willful lack of knowledge about either uh, economics or arithmetic. I must say, it, uh, it, it suggests a, a very good grasp of politics in the sense that uh, Mr. Biden and his cronies have found a way to bribe almost every constituency that they possibly could using other people's money. It reminds me, Jake, frankly, uh, of that old sort of wag about you can understand the, po the process of politics by examining the root words, poly from the Latin for many and tick from the English colloquial for small blood sucking insects. This is certainly a political bill. It makes no sense from an economic perspective. It makes no sense from an arithmetic perspective, but it makes all kinds of sense from a political perspective. Yes, yeah, speaking of words, you know, in George Orwell's book, 1984, when he's talking about this world that they're building, that basically they're going to redefine words. And while I was watching them say that, yeah, I used to kind of get upset, like a little worried about what's happening. At this point, I'm just thoroughly entertained because when I see a half a dozen people go on television and say $3.5 trillion out of thin air that's borrowed from the Federal Reserve that printed it out of nothing, then gave it to us at debt equals zero, I just like burst out laughing. And I want to know... Uh, what do you think are the uh, ramifications of this and why does 3.5 trillion not equal zero? Well, let's go back to your definitions. Um, they would define that as quantitative easing. That's their language. I would define it as counterfeiting. <laughs> uh, I think my use of English is proper and their use of English is obfuscatory. That's a good word for them. Um, as you suggest, the ramifications of counterfeiting $3.5 trillion on top of that which they've already counterfeited is at least over time debasing the currency. And at some point in time, and I can't say when this is, arithmetic certainly overwhelms narrative, uh, and they'll have a problem then. It would appear that the political class is less concerned about having a problem then than having a problem now. And so to the extent and by the way, this is a well-trodden path in government. Uh, it was tried in Weimar, Germany. It ended up, of course, with the election of Hitler. It was perfected probably by Gideon Gono uh, in Zimbabwe. 
<laughs> oh, was who, he was that the president during that time? No, it was the finance minister. Okay. Uh, it, it was somebody who was more efficient at bad math than the president, <laughs> uh, who was merely a murderous thug. Uh, it is also being tried uh, in Venezuela. So you can see how this ends. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that the US at present resembles Venezuela. I'm only suggesting that if you spend more money than you have, ultimately what you do is you debase the currency. And I think that's precisely what's happening. Uh, at present, it would seem like there are various constituencies of voters, many of whom are not taxpayers, that like the circumstance that you get to consume now a range of government goods and services and pay later and probably somebody else pays later for your listeners who are overwhelmingly producers and savers uh, this is a very bad circumstance whether or not it's a bad circumstance that causes them to have a negative outcome in the near term or the longer term is something i'm not prepared to count on but we've talked before uh on air you and i about two different words, uh, one being inevitable and the other being eminent. Uh, the fact is that deficit spending on this order of magnitude and debt and deficits, which is a different problem, never, ever arithmetically has a happy ending. Uh, whether the threat is imminent is something I can't tell you, but the, the fact that the threat is inevitable is certainly something I can tell you. So what are the ramifications of printing money like this. You said that Weimar Germany, which you know many know is kind of one of the more historic examples of hyperinflation. And then you said on the other side of it, um, they elected Hitler. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate for someone that, you know, they say, hey, look, you know, this system's unfair and I need my money too at this point. And so they should keep printing it. And then there's people like Ron Paul that have warned for many years that this is a hidden tax uh, that actually makes people more poor. And I was just wondering, could you elaborate for someone that, you know, maybe they agree with you. They don't really trust government. They, they, they're on the same page, but you know, maybe they're not doing that well financially. Maybe they lost their job. So they're saying, Hey, you know, keep printing the money. This is better than nothing. What, what are the real long-term social ramifications of, of doing this type of experiment? Uh, that's a great question, Jake. And I want to disclaim the fact that I'm not an economist. I'm a credit analyst first. But I would say that the real ramification is that it postpones a reckoning. And if you postpone a reckoning, you almost always have to pay back with interest. So the fact that you were able to skate through today and tomorrow and the day after on other people's money means that ultimately when society itself has to pay the bill, the bill is much, much, much larger. For the first 10 years of Weimar Germany, uh, nobody noticed what was happening except that the prices of goods and services increased. And as the price of goods and services increased, the demands on the Commonwealth by those who couldn't keep up with the increases grew and grew and grew. Uh, and the consequence of that is that the people who were dependent on the system became more dependent on the system until the system simply couldn't stand the demands that were placed upon it. Now, for a different class of people, uh, a class of people who are savers, the circumstance that is in front of us now is desperate. If you are a saver during a period of inflation, printing, and artificially low interest rates at once, uh, the arithmetic is really depressing. Let's say, Jake, this doesn't apply to you, perhaps, but to some of your older listeners. The world's benchmark savings instrument is the U.S. 10-year Treasury. At present, it yields 125 basis points, 1.25%. So you give the U.S. federal government money for 10 years, and they pay you 1.25% on it. The problem with that is that according to U.S. government statistics, inflation or the depreciation of the purchasing power of the currency 
is growing at 5.5%. So you are losing four and a quarter percent every year for 10 years, which means cumulatively and compounded uh, over 10 years, you have lost 65% of your purchasing power in an allegedly riskless instrument. Wow. Uh, think about that. You are trying to do the right thing. You've worked, you've saved for your retirement or you saved to afford something. And you've tried to save in what is allegedly the least risky savings instrument in the world, the US 10 year treasury. And as a consequence for, of you for living your life correctly, saving, forestalling consumption, the value proposition is that you will lose two thirds of your purchasing power over 10 years. Now that arithmetic is stark. It's truly stark. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, Dr. Michael Burry, you know, guy from the big short, um, he warned earlier this year that he believes that we're headed towards hyperinflation. And I know you've heard people talk like that in the precious metal space forever. And it always seemed like a bit of an exaggeration, but especially when you draw those parallels to Weimar Germany and you say for nine or 10 years, they just saw, you know, increased inflation, no, nothing like 10,000% in one year randomly, but a steady increase, which then made everyone demand more from the government. So the government prints more, gives everyone more to make up for the hidden tax of inflation as, pur as purchasing power goes down and cost of living goes up. And I'm looking at it now and I'm just saying we're at a stage now in this cycle where the actual government is saying $3.5 trillion equals zero. Mm -hmm. And so I say, I don't know how a total loss of currency is, is even avoidable anymore. Um, what do you think? Uh, I lived through the decade of the 70s, Jake. Uh, during the 70s, uh, we had double digit rates of inflation. A and I need to say uh, for working people in particular, it was scary. Periods of inflation for people like me are much less scary. If the uh, interest rate that one pays to attract capital, to borrow capital, if you have access to credit, means that you can keep pace with inflation because the delta between the return on capital employed and the cost of capital is great. Uh, people like me can defend themselves during periods of inflation. It's the people that don't have access to credit that really get hurt. And that's most people. I personally believe that it's much more likely than not that we relive in some fashion the experience that we had in the 70s. Uh, I, I realize that that isn't a very inflammatory headline. Uh, I personally believe that we will get through what we're experiencing now. I don't think we'll get through unscathed. I think it'll be a character building experience. That's unnecessary for me because I'm already a character, but I think it's going to happen. What's scarier to me is that uh, people don't want to consider the problem when the depreciation of the currency is only 5.5%. Got it. That isn't dramatic enough for them, which frankly, Jake, is idiotic. The, the idea that somebody would express concern at the prospect of 15% inflation, which may happen or may not happen, uh, and wait until double-digit inflation without recognizing the impact of 5.5% inflation on the nation and on their individual balance sheet is from my point of view, actually tragic. If I were to hire you for a speech and my speech was, Rick, I want you to debunk the idea that inflation is only 5.5%. I want you to give a presentation on how it's actually higher. Uh, do you think you would be able to do that? And do you think 5.5% inflation is an accurate reflection or do you think we're already in double digits? Uh, different question. I'll entertain it. Uh, but I think people need to be terrified of 5.5. Okay, they enough. don't need a higher number. Now, debunking it is simple. Uh, I would only ask your audience 
if they believe that the people who, who uh, compiled the CPI shop where they shopped. <laughs> I would ask your listeners to, uh, if they drive, remember the price of gasoline a year ago and think about it now. I would ask them to consider the fact that the starting wage at the Safeway in the town that I live in, in Anacortes, Washington, is $20 an hour. Uh, I would ask them to uh, think about the five sacks of groceries that they bought at Safeway or Costco and think about what that sack of groceries would have cost them a year ago. I would ask them, too, to uh, think about the hedonistic adjustment in the CPI, the argument that since apartments are better now than they were 20 years ago, that they should cost more. The difficulty with hedonistic adjustments is that people who can't afford them can't rent apartments the same way they could 20 years ago. In other words, the only thing that's available is the so-called hedonistically adjustment, adjusted uh, uh, apartment. I, I would ask them too to consider uh, that during periods where there's an increase in core inflation or volatility, that the people who, can, who compile the index leave out food and fuel. Now, as you can tell by looking at me, Jake, I like to eat. Uh, and the cost of living adjustment that doesn't include uh, food and fuel or bourbon uh, is not one that's appropriate to my lifestyle. Finally, Jake, uh, the idea that the cost of living uh, index doesn't include tax is an insanity. Uh, if taxes aren't part of your cost of living, you are either extremely poor or according to the government, you're a felon. <laughs> um, perhaps if I didn't have to pay the tax, I wouldn't complain quite so much about its exclusion from the index. But the idea that you compile a cost of living index that is hedonistically adjusted I can see hedonistic adjustments for technology, by the way, uh, but in terms of shelter that's hedonistically adjusted uh, when the old style shelter isn't available at any cost, one that when it's convenient doesn't include food or fuel, and one that doesn't include tax, uh, I would argue with you, Jake, that the index is good for headlines mm -hmm. and, and very little else. But much more importantly, uh, an audience like today's audience that requires uh, the sort of headline stimulation uh, about 20% inflation coming in order to get excited is an audience that doesn't have a sense of history or arithmetic. 5.5% compound inflation, particularly in a 125 basis point interest rate environment, is a catastrophe. So um, one of the other ways that I feel like it's a catastrophe is, you know, when you couple that obviously with everything from the supply chain shortages, the fact that it seems almost impossible for them to stop printing. Um, you know, simultaneously, there's been a lot of call from the left to not renominate Powell because I think they think he's too fiscally conservative <laughs> or something. And, you know, so the writing looks on the wall there then you couple that with the labor shortages, you know, all over town. I mean, like everywhere. Uh, when I talk to, you know, wherever I go, whether it's a post office, uh, whether I just hop into a little store, there's a little tiny corner store near my house and they were training someone new. It's always the same guy. And I said, Hey, you guys got someone. And he's like, yeah, I've been trying to get someone for a year. So we hired two people cause they showed up. And so all the writing is on the wall for like actually like a biblical <laughs> type of like catas catastrophe socially, politically, and economically. And, and we could talk about it forever and you could explain it very eloquently. But as we wrap up, I want to know what should one do? You know, there's certain things we can and can't control. What does one do? What, you know, Rick rules, you know, is an, is an incredibly, 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 wealthy, intelligent, successful guy that knows what's going on. You can talk forever about eloquent ways to explain how bad it is, but what do I do right now? What, what should I be doing? Four things, Jake. No, five things. 
you're doing one of them wonderfully well, which is to say, invest in yourself and organize yourself around a product or service that delivers real utility to somebody else. Uh, you don't have to own your own business. You can be an employee in somebody else's business, but you need to invest in yourself to the point where you're absolutely indispensable to your customer. That's the first thing. Uh, when people who work at McDonald's say they aren't getting a living wage, it's true. It's not a living wage. Uh, and so you need to develop a skill set that allows you to deliver utility to the market so that you can earn a living wage. So the first thing that you have to do is put yourself in the mindset that says that you make money by delivering utility to other people. That's the very first thing to do. In order to get value, you have to give value. And if you're in a circumstance right now where you can't do that, you have to change your circumstance because the circumstance ain't gonna change for you. You get value by giving value. That's the most important thing. The second thing I think that you have to do is you have to save. And this contradicts some of what I said earlier. The idea that you save and you get paid 125 basis points on your savings while your purchasing power goes down uh, by 550 basis points a year is counterintuitive, except that if you have cash or if you have liquid assets, if you have a liquidity squeeze, if the broad equity markets falls by 50 or 60%, if we have the same lack of trust in financial institutions that we experienced in 2008, the liquid assets that you have when nobody else has liquid assets will give you both the tools and hopefully the courage to take advantage of the situation rather than being taken advantage of. Understand that the negative real yield that you get on your savings is an option premium. It gives you the ability to act when other people can't act. Three, have part of your savings in liquid assets that don't depreciate uh, alongside fiat assets. That's a fancy way of saying own some physical gold and silver. What's nice about physical gold and silver is that you don't have to own too much. If you have a circumstance where the fiat goes to hell in a handbasket, the upside that you get in your physical gold and silver means that a small insurance premium, which is to say a small holding in physical gold and silver, offsets a very large deterioration in the purchasing power of your fiat currency. So absolutely save part of your wealth in gold and silver. The fourth is if you can afford it with a small amount of your money, speculate. Give yourself the ability, if you can afford to lose it, to participate in asset classes that are so deeply out of favor that when they return to favor, you can enjoy tenfold or 15-fold internal rates of return. Don't employ this strategy with money that you can't afford to lose half of, but by all means, if you can afford to speculate, don't speculate in the flavor of the month. If pot stocks are hot, stay as far away from them as you possibly can. Uh, speculate on out of favor, disaggregated uh, circumstances that have legitimate 10 or 15 to one potential with a small amount of your net worth. Uh, you know, I've had circumstances in my life where a 5% investment in an asset class doubled my net worth, wow. uh, which is extremely pleasant. What do you think occurs. the best speculation is over the next 12 to 24 months or one of the best right now? We'll get back to that. Uh, I, I don't see anything that's a 10 bagger out there today, but we'll get back to that. The fifth thing is stay positive. Uh, too many people look at the circumstance and say, there's no way out. I can't get ahead because of Biden. I can't get ahead because of the World Economic Forum. I can't get ahead because of the socialists. That's all bullshit. Uh, in any set of circumstances, somebody who pays attention to rule number one, which is deliver value for other people, will come out ahead. We will come through this circumstance 10 years from now, 15 years from now, at some point in time, stronger than we are now. Don't use the malaise in front of us as an excuse for doing nothing. Do something. Prepare positively. I believe, as an example, that the broader equity indexes in the United States, the S&P 500, listen, it, it, probably four different times in my career, the S&P 500 has fallen by 40 or 50%. 
it was extremely unpleasant to go through that period of time. But when you look at a chart of the S&P 500 going back 60 years, you almost can't see those 50% declines. So I believe as a society that the ultimate direction that we face is higher, much higher. I just believe that we're going to have a real test like we had in the 1970s, getting from here to there. So let's do them again. Generate utility. That's number one. Focus on making yourself more valuable to your customers, irrespective of your circumstance. Save, despite the fact that the current return on liquid assets is zero, consider it either insurance or an option premium. Save part of your liquid assets in gold and silver and pray to God they don't go up understanding that the set of circumstances that you are afraid of will likely make them go much, much higher than other people think. Think of it as a, an insurance class. If you can afford to, if you can afford to, speculate. And if you speculate, don't just speculate with your money, speculate with your time, choose your speculations, you know, very well. And finally, be positive. Don't be paralyzed. Be positive, be proactive. Don't be a victim. And that was powerful. There's a lot of other things I'd like to say, but that was very, very, very good. And one of the things that I've always liked and respected about you most is, you know, you're very aware, obviously, of, of, of the ramifications of our social and economic political system and, you know, the direction that it's taking us. But what many people do when they learn it is it makes them angry and they're very knowledgeable about it. They watch so many shows and they're really understanding it, but they're still broke or they're still in debt or they've, as you said, they've essentially given the power of their freedom away to socialism, money printing, communists, whatever it is, some key word, um, the world economic forum, as you said, and, and, you know, I think your message was really powerful because at the end of the day, regardless of any of that happening, you know, we can still figure it out for ourselves, right? We have to. You know, uh, earlier generations have had some problems. I think of the generation uh, behind me. They had a couple small problems, the Great Depression, World War II. Uh, we've been tried in this fashion before. It's uh, it's more apparent to us because it's happening to us. Um, but those people who outcompete other people will have better outcomes. It's just as simple as that. People who outcompete other people, people who generate more utility for other people, will do better than the people who don't. The great tragedy, uh, I think, of the quote commonwealth is that we're training people not to be better than other people, not to live up to their own potential, uh, to be victims, to be beneficiaries. You know, you get what you pay for, Jake. Uh, if you pay for somebody to be an uneducated dolt, uh, <laughs> some of them will choose to be uneducated dolts. I'm tempted to say they'll get what they deserve, good and hard, but I actually don't feel that way. Uh, I think in some senses, society is manufacturing uh, uneducated, lazy dolts. And I think that's very tragic. Yeah, well said. And I agree with you. I feel like it's a, it's a, uh, what I would call a socially engineered thing. And that's why I think that the message that, you know, you, that you preach about personal responsibility and, uh, taking 100% personal responsibility for promoting, creating and allowing everything in your financial life, and, you know, it's why, obviously it's why you've been so successful and so much more successful than maybe a lot of other people we've had on the show, because maybe they're, some of them are so much more focused on the problems and you do a good job of balancing it. And I think it's a really important message for all of us. So um, for everyone listening, uh, we want to thank Rick for coming on. Let us know in the comments, one big idea you thought of, maybe you can think of one big goal 
or one big way where you can level up your life right now, write it down on a piece of paper. You can leave it down in the comments. We got Rick. We'll do a free portfolio review for you right there down below. You'll see the link in the description. Uh, smash a like button on this video. We're going to head over to part two on this, where we're going to be talking a little bit about the uranium market as well. So make sure you hit the subscribe and bell notification on this video to get notified for future episodes. Give us a comment for the YouTube algorithm. Uh, Rick, anything I've missed or any way you want to wrap up? Well, if I could talk about the offer a little bit, uh, Please. you know, if people, people who care what I have to say about investing can find out in a very personalized way what I think. If you submit your natural resource portfolio to the link below, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, I will personally rank your portfolio, at least those stocks I know, one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I will include, uh, if you include the word charts in the question line, the Barron's Gold Mining Index, uh, which is the best visual aid to understand the dynamics of precious metals markets that I've ever seen, and a 100-year commodity chart that talks about just how cheap industrial commodities are compared to other asset classes going back 100 years. Once again, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Enter your natural resource stocks. Please, no pot stocks. Please, no cryptocurrencies. Please, no meme stocks, no tech stocks. Understand I'm a 68-year-old Luddite. Natural resource stocks only. Uh, and I'd love to assist you in that regard. So thanks everyone for watching this video and we'll see you on part two.